How do you feel about this? The interview, you, your story. The interview? Well, I've never given an interview before, so I don't know what to think, really. Hmm. Is it because you've never wanted to or because no one has seemingly expressed interest in your story? Well, it's mostly because I just never had the opportunity, I think. How did you wind up homeless? How did I wind up homeless? Simple. I got a bus from Albuquerque back to L.A. and I didn't have money, didn't have money to uh, rent a place to live. I didn't have, you know, a way to get started. So I simply wound up on the sidewalk. And how long ago was that? That was in 2000. You've been unhoused for 23 years. Uh, I, I'm saying 22 going on 23. What is life on the street like for you? Real pain in the neck. Because, because you don't have a place to live. You, you can't just get up, take a shower, go to the kitchen, fix breakfast, have a cup of coffee, read the newspaper, and, you know, and then start your day. No, your, your, your day starts the minute you pop and open your eyes, you throw your sleeping bag in your backpack, and now what do you do? Well, you just don't have anything else to do. For me, it's uh, go, go, get a, you know, go get a cup of coffee. Well, so go and, get a, go and get a couple cups of coffee. Well, okay, there's, from there, there's nothing to do. You know, or you or you have to go, or you have to go to a soup kitchen, you know, and stand in line for for lunch, you know, or, or uh, go to a church to take a shower, and things like this, and it, it's just it's all sporadic. There is no order, you know, and I I find it just a life of disorder. Yeah. I, I find I find it completely confusing and degrading. Actually. Degrading, actually, because you're 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 truly like an, just just another number. You're here. Mm -hmm. You get here in 2000. What did you start doing? Did you get a job? Could you find a job? No. People won't give you a job because you don't have. In my case, being self-employed for 10 years after 10 years with the carnival. I have no, I have no verifiable re job references. I have no address, and at the time, no phone number, no point of contact. And people are like, no, they, they don't want to hire me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's because, it's because I don't have the things that everybody else has that says this person isn't employable, e even though, uh, even though it really doesn't take much to show up on time and wash dishes for eight hours. It's a pretty simple job, but no, the employers got, they have their standards and I'm below it. Why do you feel like that? Because I've been told that. Really? I have been told, go away, no, you can't have a job application because you're homeless. And how does that feel, Cash? Actually, if I hear it one more time, I'm going to melt down. Why? Because it's wrong. Because if I'm actually a human being, I, sh I should have the same chances as everybody else. When did the pain start? Now, the pain, actually, uh, the pain really started in uh, right right around May of 2022. I ignored it for several months, up until uh, about December of uh, 2020. What was hurting? Going to, uh, actually everything, uh, from here all the way down to here. You know, from the top of my ear down to the bottom of my neck. And it was uh, just really tremendous. Nothing I could do about it because...
tell me how tremendous it was and what you would do, what people would hear? Oh, people, it was so bad that I, I just screamed uncontrollably. I mean, literally, at the top of my lungs. And people would call the police because I'm making a nuisance. And the idea was get rid of him. Well, the whole problem there was is I was trying to get help through a social worker and things like this. They would take me to the clinic. The clinic would send me to a dermatologist. I have skin cancer. They sent me to a dermatologist. Then the dermatologist would just say, well, just put this cream on it or take these antibiotics, which weren't working. And then I'd be screaming again. And next thing you know, then they'd call an ambulance, take me to the emergency room. Here, have some pain medication. You know, you need to go back to your regular doctor at the clinic and then go back to another dermatologist. And this went on for a year. You were like in this washing machine cycle of just trying to see somebody and trying to get help and you just kept going round and round. That, that's, a, that's a good way to put it because uh, actually there's sometimes when I, I actually didn't feel like I was in a washing machine more like a tumble dryer mm -hmm. with, with it all the way up on, on high, you know. You're not, not only are we going around in circles, but it's getting hot in here. <laughs> but in dealing with the terrible set of circumstances, you have had an incredible amount of kindness shown your way. Here lately, I sure have. <laughs> and I am grateful for every bit of it. How did that start? So Tatiana uh, bumped into me. And uh, she, uh, she asked if there was anything I could do. I said, well, nothing really right now. And uh, she asked where I was staying. I told her. Well, she went home and told Carmen, her partner, yeah, about my situation. In fact, I was sleeping on a cold slab in the rain. At a church. In front of a church. So Carmen says, well, let's go get him. And they come to find out, they, they showed up about 9 o'clock, but I had already taken uh, one of the strongest pain pills that I had, and I was gone. You couldn't wake me no matter what. So Tatiana decided the next morning to come back. And she caught me. I had just taken the pill and I laid back down. So she's like, good morning. She goes, would you like to come to, would you like to come to my house? And I'm like, well, I really don't, I'm thinking I really don't have a choice. I said, okay. We'll do that. Why would you not have a choice? Because uh, between cancer and exposure to the weather, I was going downhill, and I knew it. I was uh, basically I was on my way out. Mm. So these two women hmm? welcome you into their home. Right. And how was that? Actually. It was kind of odd because I'm not used to sleeping on a bed. Yeah. The, the first night I was there, yeah. I, because uh, I had all my stuff with me. The first night I was there, I crawled, crawled uh, in bed, and I got thinking, well, maybe I'll get, a, well, I'll get up and get the sleep mag and sleep in that. Because the bed didn't feel right. Yeah, because it felt odd. So in the time you were with them, what did they do for you? Very simple. Well, they bought me, uh, bought me like three more suits of clothes, more socks, now I've got them coming out my ears. Three meals a day. I'm used to eating two if I'm lucky. Uh, I had a shower every day. You know, uh, a place to sleep every night. This is all provided by them. And then top it all off, before I left, he took me to uh, took me to Irvine to see about a car, which uh, come to find out, 
someone had donated to the church for me to get a, another car, we all end up buying the thing and coming home. So much changed in your life just in those three weeks you were with them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's only because of one thing. One thing only. Two people that actually care about somebody. Hmm. And I don't mean, I don't mean, nice to see you, God bless you, be on your way. No. They really do care. Reverend Jesse Smith, she really cares. My friend Dr. Dave Neska really cares. The people like these in my life, I've, I've, got, I've got to land on my feet. And the fact that Dr. Dr. Sabai has been such a great help, you know, with, with the cancer treatments and everything else, now I can actually see, I can actually see a brighter, much brighter future. How does it feel to have people treat you well? Yeah, people treat me well. It feels wonderful because you, you can go just about anywhere and be treated like just another number, just another face in the crowd, somebody who's not important. Seems like anybody and everybody will treat you like that. But the few that actually treat you like, like a real person, you know, treat you like you mean something to them, it's priceless. I didn't want to do this story and have you look like a fish in a fishbowl that we were just looking at. <laughs> okay. And I appreciate that because respect is a good starting point in all this. Because if you have respect for somebody else, you're not going to look at them like that. That's right. I wanted to do this because I think we have a lot to learn from the way these people have treated you. And I, and I hope other people do learn it. Because if we, if we can spread the good around, there's less bad. And, you, and that's probably the only real way to get rid of the homeless problem. Surely there will be people who watch this who say, why doesn't he stay at a shelter? And the reason for that, there's two very good reasons for this. One is I still have open wounds from my cancer. That's considered a health issue. They will not allow that. And number two is I have ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. I am not accepted by other homeless people. It causes trouble. Well, why? What do you mean? I'm different than they are. Okay? I don't drink, I don't use drugs. I'm different than they are. So therefore, I'm an outcast. And they don't want me in their shelter. Uh, and they are very territorial like that. And it causes trouble. And it causes a lot of trouble. I've been in fights and shelters. You feel like people look at you and think you're mentally ill because you're homeless? The average person will look at someone who is homeless and will see someone who, who drinks too much, will see a drug addict, will see someone who's mentally ill because he won't take the time to even bother to say hello. They won't take the time to strike up a conversation with you. So you're automatically labeled. What is it going to take for you to become housed on your feet and no longer on the street? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of work. That, that's one thing for sure. Because now that I have another car, uh, as this cancer stuff is uh, is cleared up. I intend on going back to work for DoorDash, 
that'll give me some type of an income. But with the prices of rent around here, I don't know what I can afford. And so it occurred to me between Carmen and Tatiana, Reverend Jesse, your friend the retired doctor. Mm -hmm. There's also been a merry-go-round and this human chain of kindness. And that's, that's, the, that's the best merry-go-round to be on. Yeah. Because what I can see is it's a lot of good things and no side effects. Yeah. Yeah. How much money do you have now? Right now I got about twenty dollars. You know, I got about twenty dollars and three quarters of a tank of gas. Not too bad. I've been in worse shape. Where are you sleeping? I'm sleeping back into the car right now. And uh you know, it's because I'm still in transition phase because I have to, I have to get through cancer treatments before I can, uh, before I can start back up with DoorDash. Do you feel like there is hope for you? I certainly feel more hope now than than I did than I did a month ago. You know, it's like is a month month ago it was like, you know, will somebody just hurry up and pull the plug on me and just get it over with? Because mm. I was just exhausted. You know, now it's, there's a lot more hope. I mean, I can see myself getting better now. Yeah, I can are. see myself, I can see myself get, getting back to doing some type of meaningful work. You know, and, and that, that I find very hopeful. How has this interview been for you? Actually, fun. Good. And the reason why I say that is because I finally had a chance to say what's on my mind for a change. Mm. Instead of just like, what, why tell you anything you, you wouldn't even listen? You know, a lot of other people's like, why tell you anything you people don't listen? You know, finally I had a chance to say what I need to say.